my plan is um, to talk a little more theory and then we'll do some practice at the end, but just to understand what a fractal tree index is, why it's cool, how it works, uh, what its strengths are, and then we'll talk some practice how at Toku Tech we've applied fractal tree indexes to the MySQL world with a product called TokuDB, and uh, we are currently applying it to, to Mongo, MongoDB, um, with a as yet to be named uh, product. I'm Tim Callahan, I'm the VP of Engineering at Toku Tech. Uh, contact info's up there. I love to talk databases, uh, so if anyone wants to contact me, uh, feel free. Also in the audience uh, sitting uh, to, to my left is uh, Bradley Kuzmal, who's one of the founders. So I will do fractal tree indexes at a level I think most of us will appreciate and understand and enjoy, but certainly uh, another level of depth if someone wants to grab Bradley later in the day, uh, he can take it down a level. So let's talk some, some theory. Um, at a very high level, what I want to discuss is just what your basic B tree is as a data structure and how it applies to, uh, to indexing. Um, then we'll look at how B trees are used by NODB, uh, from, which is a MySQL storage engine, for, uh, for helping it get its job done, how we've applied fractal trees to our TokuDB storage engine for MySQL. And then I'll discuss in a few slides uh, the way I see MongoDB storage at the moment and how we're applying fractal tree indexes uh, to Mongo as well. We'll do some simple scenarios. We're just going to build simple B trees. We're not going to get into things like splits and merges and the more complex uh, areas of how they work. So at a, at a very high level, this is what a B tree looks like. Um, I assume most people here, uh, if you're interested in data structures, it's a pretty simple, straightforward one. It has a great Wikipedia page if you want a little more uh, detail. But this is kind of the picture that we'll use uh, throughout the first 20 or 30 slides here. Uh, from a vocabulary perspective, uh, B trees are good there at, at helping you store and find things in a, uh, in a rapid way. So if you look at this picture, um, what looks like a, a pyramid scheme here, um, each of these uh, rectangular areas we'll just refer to as a node. Um, anything above the bottom we'll call internal nodes. The, the very bottom is, is what we we'll call a leaf node. So the internal nodes in a B tree are really more about uh, searching. It's a path. So it's a way to understand. If you want to look something up, the internal nodes help you get there. The leaf nodes themselves are going to store the actual data for these examples. Um, you can see up top there's these lines in the middle of these uh, nodes. We call them pivots. So that lets you know at the top if I have a number, the number 5, for example, a pivot help, helps me understand am I going to go to the right or the left of that pivot. There's pointers that take you down the, the tree itself, uh, down to the bottom. And we'll, when I say actual data, it'll become pretty simple to understand in a, in a rapid way here. So very simple example. This is a, a B tree that's got a, uh, we're just going to put one value uh, in these internal nodes. Uh, as things get more complex, you can, uh, this value of B, you can make it as wide as you want. So these nodes, it, it could be a much more complex picture. but. To understand how things are working here, um, my rule is greater than or equal to. You can have any rule you want, but if you look at this, the internal nodes are for pathing. So at the, at the root, the very top, we have the number 22. If I wanted to search for something, anything I search for is either greater than or equal to 22 when I go to the right, or less than when I go to the left. Um, down at the bottom in these uh, leaf nodes, we're storing values. And you can see there's multiple values in these leaf nodes. Uh, normally, you're going to store these in some kind of sorted order, so when you get down there, you can look them up efficiently. But nice, simple, filled out uh, B tree for example purposes. Um, how this relates to databases? What do you do in a database? You you put things in, you delete things, you mutate them with updates, or you do a lot of searching. So in this example, if we wanted to find the value, we wanted to ask our database, what is uh, is 25? Uh, does it exist? So the, the path we take is highlighted in red. The value 25, I, I start at the root. It's greater than 22, I go to the right. It's less than 99, I go to that left pointer. I land in a leaf node that has two values, 22 and 25. And, and lo and behold, I find, yes, 25 is there. And hopefully, uh, you know, my, my system, if I program this, even a, a not experienced programmer, this would be relatively performant. Um, very simple operation. If I want to insert something, it's a similar operation. I have to 
first understand where I would put what I'm going to insert. So if I'm going to insert 15, I'm to the left of 22. To the right of 10, I land in that leaf node at the bottom. There's already the values 10 and 20. And I store 15 in the middle, so it, it retains its sorted properties there. Um, so, so B trees get a little more complicated when they get large. So from a per performance perspective, if, if you're, you know, in, in that very simple example, that many values, that's, I could probably store that in, in a certain number of bytes. Uh, with databases, they get bigger. You store a million rows, a hundred million rows, a billion rows. Um, there's some data, some technologies exist that do a really fantastic job and they keep you in memory and they have their performance characteristics. Um, something like MySQL, for example, you build a prototype website, it runs very quickly, and then you, you hit a, uh, uh, people start using your website, it, it gets traction and, and things suddenly can, can fall apart quickly. But what this slide is trying to show that with the database especially, at some point in time, your, your internal nodes, hopefully those all fit in memory in, in the RAM box there. Uh, one or more leaf nodes might fit in RAM, but eventually some of these other leaf nodes are going to have to actually land on disk. And that's going to make it challenging. When I go to search this B tree to find a value, I'm going to need to do I.O. off my disk, my SSD, spinning disks, EBS volume, you name it. It's going to start to slow down the performance of my system. Um, so at a high level, that's a B tree. Talk a little bit about how NODB, which is a uh, MySQL storage engine, uh, utilizes B trees to get its work done. Uh, so NODB, there's there's a primary key uh, in most databases. You're going to have a primary key on any table, and then one or more secondary indexes. Uh, what NODB does with the primary key is it stores it um, your data clustered. So there's certain database technologies where um, the, the, the raw data itself is, is separate and segmented from the index. Uh, the index is on that data. An example of that would be MongoDB, uh, MyISAM, a storage engine for MySQL, for example. So they're going to put all your data in, in a heap type of store, and they're going to put the indexes separately. Uh, in a DB cluster, so what a clustering index is, is the path, as you can see here, we're going to still use um, the, uh, the primary key itself for ordering. So in this example, I have a table T where A is my primary key, and I have B and C. And if you look down at the leaf nodes, just to simulate what rows would look like, we have two rows in that leftmost leaf node. The primary key for A is the value two, and the second uh, row, the value is four. Um, so as you can see, you know, very intimately ties together the primary key itself with the data that's uh, stored there. But the real advantage to this, uh, this methodology is when I'm looking something up by primary key, I go down my B tree, and once I find the, the row, I have all the data. I don't have to go somewhere else to get the rest of the row. What Inno does for secondary keys is it stores, um, the, the secondary key itself is used for ordering purposes and lookups, but the payload or the value that's stored with it is actually just a point, the primary key itself. So as you can see here, um, in the leftmost node, I have a, a, a row or value negative 5 comma 20, and what that represents is I have a, a B value of negative 5, and the primary key for that row is the value 20. Um, I'm not sure if I have this in a future, I have it in a future slide so we can talk about the impact of that. But it makes it challenging because when I want to look things up using the secondary index, all the secondary index is doing is providing me primary keys. And as you can imagine, the challenge then becomes I have to go look up the values for those primary keys and things can start to get inefficient in a hurry. Um, and this, this slide really points that out. So, an example here would be a very simple SQL syntax. I've got that same table example. If I want to execute this query, I want to select star, so I want all columns from the table T with B equals 12. Um, to the left, what I'm representing is my secondary index. So I say, you know, go down this B tree and find me one, one or more rows, get me their primary keys where the value B is 12. I go down the tree following that red path and I, I indeed find that for the value 12, I have a primary key of 10, and for the value 12, I have a primary key value of 2. So I take those two PKs, and I go over to the primary key index, and I do the same thing. I want to find PK 10 and 2. I go down and take two dips into this uh, B tree and, and get the, the star for my query, which is going to be the values for, uh, for ABC. Things get a little more complicated as you have more columns in your tables, of course. But what this really points out is, uh, something people in the NODB world call a, it's a, almost like a hidden joint. 
So even though this is a very simple single table SQL statement, behind the scenes it's almost like I'm doing a join and that I have to go get information twice. I have to get values from the secondary index and then go into the primary key to get the rest of the row. If I want to do an insert, um, there's two things to be done here since I have two indexes on this table. So the primary key, um, I'm going to insert the values 8, 9, 10. So the, the, um, what I'm going to end up doing here is the primary key on the right, I'm going to put the value 8, 9, 10 down in that leaf node. And, and if that leaf node isn't in memory, I'm going to have to read it in and get it. Um, what Inno does that's a little bit clever is um, in the secondary index, I have to insert the value uh, 9, which is the value for B, and 8, which is the primary key. So Inno, um, five, five years ago or so, came up with a concept to say, hey, I know I need to maintain the secondary index, but the, uh, the leave note data on big databases might not be in memory. And if it's not, I want to buffer that and just kind of hang on to it. And at some future point, I might do some I.O. and bring that, that node in. But for now, I'll just put it in this small uh, secondary buffer. Um, they call that a secondary key buffer. And what that did for you know, uh, when I do my benchmarking on InnoDB, I find it's, uh, it adds a tremendous performance boost to what Inno had without this, because prior to this on big data, Inno always had to read in the leaf nodes on all indexes on tables, and it really slowed down the workload, um, especially on insertions. Um, keep in mind, though, as you can see, there's a buffer in the upper right-hand corner there. It buffers inserts, updates, and deletes to this index. Um, buffers are always limited in size. There's trade-offs. You can make the buffer bigger, but um, bigger buffers don't always mean better performance. It's uh, you know, When that buffer overflows, it has to be empty. So Sometimes you're just delaying the inevitable by trying to make that too big. Um, so let's talk about how fractal trees uh, work and how they might change what we just looked at for, for a storage engine like InnoDB. Um, two similarities between a, a fractal tree index and a, and a B tree that Inno would use. So the first, the, the similarities are we're going to store the data down in the lead nodes, just like Inno did. And we're going to use the primary key. It's going to be clustered, just like Inno was. The large differences we have here are, are highlighted below. One is, you can see on those internal uh, nodes, there's a, a big rectangle next to them called a message buffer. So you know, on secondary indexes, had this little message buffer, just a buffer of some basic uh, operations on that on that tree. Um, we have very large internal node buffers, and they can they can buffer a lot more than just inserts, updates, and deletes. Um, the other difference between us and Inno is, is the node size. So if, if this were drawn to scale, and we put a fractal tree index next to an InnoDB B tree, what you would notice is our node size is 4 megabytes, uh, InnoDB's is 16 kilobytes, so it's significantly larger nodes. We're, we're able to put a lot more uh, in our message buffers, a lot more in our leaf nodes, which can lend themselves to some interesting characteristics from, a, from an SQL perspective that we'll talk about later. Um, so just like with InnoDB, the primary key, we're going we're gonna to have uh, internal nodes with pivots, and we're going to store uh, data down in those in those leaf nodes. Um, secondary keys looks very similar. So these are these are fractal trees where we haven't actually done any message buffering yet. They're just almost identical to a B, B tree implementation. Where we start to get different is when we actually operate on these. So these internal message buffers, what they allow us to do is is um, is buffer just about anything. So on the Inno example, when I did this insertion. Um, on the right, in my primary key, I had to actually, I'm sorry, on the left. In my primary key on the InnoDB, I had to actually, when, when the operation was done, I had to physically put a row for the values 8, 9, 10 down into the leaf node. But a fractal tree is going to let us buffer that into a message buffer. So um, our implementation doesn't have to be anything more than um, we wanted to insert the value 8, 9, 10. We just put that in the, in the root node. and. Uh, we do the, uh, the same operation over the secondary index. We insert an 8 and a 9. Uh, that's going to be durable. It's going to be journaled. Uh, it's, uh, we're we're going to conform to ACID, and immediately we're going to return to the user that the insertion is complete. And by capturing that message, we have enough information. If, if a moment later the user asks for that row, we can give it right back. But we've buffered everything instead of just buffering secondary index maintenance. The other interesting uh, thing to note here is our, our buffers are different than, than InnoDB. Um, as you can see, we're inserting deletes and inserts and updates, but there's a message up top 
we can buffer a message called add column. So in, in NODB, when you want to add a column, it's a big, blocking, uh, ugly operation that can take your database offline for quite some time. Uh, in a fractal tree, we can just inject a message that says, this, this table, we want to add a new column C4. It's a big int. Um, we'll just take that as a message. We'll apply it at some later time down to the actual data itself. And if you ask for C4 on any row, we can materialize it. But we don't have to actually do the work. So as it says, there are lots of operations uh, can be messages. Yeah? Um, how is the message buffer maintaining the memory of the index? So it's four megabytes, right? That's relatively large, you don't want to scan it? It's, it's four megabytes. Remember, this is a simple example in that uh, our B tree, we only have a, a branching factor of two. Yeah. Um, in this example, um, our actual implementation, I think, branching factor is 16. Yeah. So the message buffers are broken down into yeah, so, so, that, so that four megabytes message, is going to... The message buffers are indexed by the primary key. Uh, every message has a primary key in it. Well, add column does it. It's a broadcast message. Yeah. So that's in its own group. Okay. So really what we're doing here is we're, you know, part of it is, is we're, we're deferring I.O., mm -hmm. but the I.O. operation is going to be complete, very well aggregated. So eventually the buffers up top are going to overflow and push down a level. Those buffers push down a level. So by the time the, the message is to the left there next to the 10, if all those messages had to push left, we're going to do one I.O. on disk to get that leaf node into memory, and then we're going to apply potentially hundreds of operations against that leaf node for, for the cost of one I.O. And so what this sort of ability to do is you can have very, very large node sizes so that when you do the I.O., it ends up being more sequential. Than Much more sequential. So range scans, for example, are going to be yeah. extremely handled very well at the same time. Um, so talk a little bit of Mongo storage here. So Mongo is a, um, uh, a popular document storage, NoSQL system. And um, again, though, it, it contains B-treats. And what Mongo does is uh, similar to my ISAM. So if we look to the left, Mongo has a primary key. So if we wanted to insert into a collection called foo, the value 55, and we want uh, about, I'm sorry, a collection called test. And, and the, the, uh, the attribute foo, foo is going to have 55. We're going to create an index on that. Uh, behind the scenes of Mongo, you end up with two B trees. One index is the primary key, and everything in Mongo gets a, a document ID. So there's a, a series of document IDs stored to the left there. And down in the leaf nodes, there's a pointer. And the pointer goes up into the memory map heap. So there's a, a large, uh, ever growing set of files in the file system that represent the documents themselves. But nothing about the document beyond the primary key or secondary indexes is, is ever stored indexed. So Mongo's going to use pointers to get to that memory map key to, uh, to pull out the, the data for your document when you do a lookup. Uh, secondary index is the same thing. They're going to index the value foo and then have a pointer up into that heap as well. What, what we're working on is removing that heap. So if you look at uh, what's going on here, just like we did with, uh, with TofuDB for MySQL. In the primary key index, we're going we're to still maintain that document ID, underscore id, but we're going to actually store the document itself, clustered, into the uh, primary key. And then secondary indexes, we're going to store the, uh, the ID value and do the same thing we would do uh, for MySQL. So when you look something up by secondary indexes, it's going to take a, a jump over to the primary key to get its value. Uh, what you end up with here is, Rather than two indexes and a, and a heap, um, in, in our world, it's going to be uh, two fractal tree indexes to store all the document data. Uh, so talk some practice here. Um, TopoDB is a transactional MySQL storage engine. Think, think in ODB. It's, um, we run it on MySQL 5.5, Maria 5.5, uh, MySQL 5.6 is coming. It supports ACID, uh, MBCC, uh, runs on Linux. Some very high level advantages that we will talk about, and I've got some benchmarks and slides coming up to show these things. There's some performance advantages. Uh, we do quite a bit on compression compared to other technologies. And, uh, and for MySQL in particular, we're agile. Um, our performance advantages, uh, one thing to think about here is we, we talked about deferring um, IO. And, and what we can do in, in the SQL world, if you look at how NODB operates, almost any operation 
replace into, insert, ignore, when you do an update, when you do an insert on duplicate key update. InnoDB always wants to do a read before write, so it's always going to try to find an existing row and use the data that it gets from the existing row to actually perform the update operation. Um, in our world, um, since we have this messaging infrastructure, we allow you to do certain operations uh, without incurring any I.O. at all. I think the easiest example to think about is, is number three there, the, the update statement. So if I, if I have a website uh, tracking application and I want to count hits, uh, if I do this update operation, I'm going to update my table called hit counter, and I'm going to set hits equal to hits plus one where the site is www.tokutech.com. What MySQL wants to do, and what it does with InnoDB, for that particular statement is it's going to go to the table hit counter, and it's going to look up uh, a row uh, where site equals www.tokutech.com. So it's going to take a dip in. It's going to want to get the entire set of row data back. And what it ends up building is a, is a uh, it's going to physically perform the mutation on the row that, that meets that criteria, it might be multiple rows. Uh, so it's going to take a dip into the table, it's going to pull out any rows that meet that criteria, it's going to get the current value of hits, it's going to add one to that value, then it's going to go back into the primary key and, and physically update the rows themselves. Uh, in in TokuDB, we've turned that into a message. So under, under certain conditions, and this one's an easy one for us to optimize, we're just going to put a message in the top of the fractal tree that says, you know, where site equals www.tokutech.com, just update hits to hits plus one. As long as the developer doesn't care about the number of affected rows, and, and most applications don't, no one really cares what hits was or what it's going to be until something comes along later and says, give me hits for www.tokutech.com. And the value to us is, when we go to do the operation to figure out uh, that value, we can apply this message and actually do the, uh, the update itself. So we're just going to insert a message in the top, and. Uh, and get to work. Um, I'm going to show some benchmark numbers. I like to have a little warning here. I am a vendor. I, I benchmark for a living. Uh, the example I use here is if, if we had a race and John came in first and Tim second and Frank third, Frank could certainly say I finished third, but Tim was second to last. Uh, benchmarks are, are, in my mind, a necessary evil in this world, but um, I'm happy to talk about what I benchmarked. I try to be fair and, and fully disclose the things I'm, I'm benchmarking, but, but certainly uh, I think benchmarks have a bad name. Yeah, you know, so here's the classic first benchmark. <coughs> um, initially when TokenDB was being created, uh, a, a big advantage of the product was indexed insertion. So have a single table, have multiple columns in that table, each with their own indexes. I believe II Bench has uh, five or six columns in the base table. It maintains three secondary indexes. And what this, in, what this benchmark is intended to show is if I take that table and I just insert as much data as quickly as possible, um, how fast can TopoDB run over the long haul and how fast can InnoDB run over the long haul ingesting this data. And what you'll see here, um, I wish I had Amber's pointer, but somewhere early on, certainly way, way before 200 million rows were inserted, um, in the beginning there, Inno is the green line. And Inno, was doing fantastic. It was up at 35,000 inserts per second, 30,000 inserts per second. But at some point around the, uh, the 100 million uh, insertion mark, the, the indexes themselves, the working data set here, became greater than RAM, and NO became very, very quickly IO bound. And the, the rate controller that this is running on is only capable of so many IOs per second. You know, completely crashes and then uh, and comes down to, I think the, the exit throughput on InnoDB was like 400 inserts per second at the end of this benchmark. Uh, TopoDB uh, did, did pay some performance penalty when it started to fall out of memory, but it, it pretty much stabilized out of the right there at around 16,000 inserts per second. So this is a fact, you know, 20, 20 x factor uh, speed up here uh, for this particular benchmark. But what it shows is for, for this type of workload, if I'm doing, you know, rapid insertions, you know, has the ability to buffer some of these inserts, Toku is, is buffering uh, much of the work and not having to do I.O. for every single insert. Uh, on, on the compression front, what's interesting about TokuDB versus Inno is, um, is just how much compression uh, we can achieve as compared to other technologies. Um, and the reasons are, are very specific with InnoDB. I think a lot of it falls back to uh, Inno was never intended to do compression. They, they tried to add that as a feature uh, very 
are much further along in the product's development cycle as they probably would have liked to. But uh, a few things here. So Nano starts with a, a small block. They're going to compress 16 kilobytes. We're going to be compressing some, somewhere near 4 megabytes. If you've ever played around with compression technologies, WinZip, TAR, you, you name it, certainly bigger things compress better as the compressor has a chance to, to look for repetition inside what it's compressing. But a big disadvantage Nano has is uh, it's, it's, its block size on disk is fixed. So even though it's starting with a small 16K block, as a DBA, when you want to do compression, you tell it, what's my target? So on disk, you can tell Nano, you know, make, your, make your blocks a kilobyte, two kilobytes, four kilobytes, eight kilobytes. And if you do the math, it's pretty simple to think, OK, if, I, if I'm going to go for a, a 4K block size on disk and I'm starting with 16K, I'll never be better than four times compression because minimally I'm going to use that four kilobytes even if I could have compressed better. So you're already going to cap how much compression you can do. Um, I think the bigger problem with, with compression in, in, in something like InnoVD is what happens when you miss. So if you take that 16K, you try to compress it to four, and, and the compression only achieves 3.5 times compression. So you're, it, it ends up with a 5K block. It has no choice but to split those two blocks and recompress the operation. That, that, that puts a pretty significant hit on performance. And there's a slide coming up that shows that. Our on-disk on size is variable. We take that, uh, that large node that we're beginning with, we compress it. What it looks like when it's done, it lands on disk exactly that way. Uh, we also support multiple compression algorithms with various trade-offs. So Inno supports uh, Zlib compression internally. We also support LZNA, which gets a better compression, or QuickLZ, which is a much, uh, much faster but lighter weight compression technology. Uh, what does that do to performance? Um, as I mentioned, when Inno uh, goes to compress a block, if it misses, it has to split it and recompress it all over again. So back to that original graph, if we don't go out quite as far, um, at this point in the benchmark, Toku was doing 15,000 inserts per second. Uncompressed Inno was at 4,000. But as soon as we said, Inno, try for 2 to 1 compression, that 8K block size, it's, uh, it paid a 5X uh, penalty in throughput. And then tried to get half as small again, it paid almost another 50%. So it can really affect performance, uh, turning on compression. The compression achieved, especially you know, depending on your data type, this is log data. So it's something I got off of a, uh, a website's uh, Apache log files. Just loaded them into the, to the various technologies. So we started out with a 6.5 gig uh, size on disk. If I told you know, go for 2 to 1 compression, it achieved it almost spot on, did a good job. I said go for 4 to 1, we got it spot on. Uh, in TopoDB, and that's with one of our lighter compression models. Uh, just plopping it at TokenDB, we got um, amazingly better compression. I think we got, uh, I think the uh, NO uh, 4 to 1 number compared to us, we were about four times better than that as well, or five times better. Uh, these messages allow us to do things uh, online in an operational way. I assume there's some MySQL users here right now, but uh, as you're probably aware, in, in MySQL, Changing schema is, is a very expensive operation. So adding, dropping, and expanding columns. You want to take an int to make it a big int. Uh, adding an index. These operations in, in, in uh, vanilla MySQL take a very long time, and they block. The table that's being operated on goes read-only for the duration uh, of the process. As a workaround in, in the field, I've seen people uh, do a couple things. One is you might take a replication slave, take it offline, do the operation, catch up to the master, and then trade places do the operation all over again on the, uh, on the other slate. Um, there's also some what I'll call helper tools. Percona has an online schema change tool. Uh, there's MySQL 5.6 that has some of this in it. Um, I think they're, they're useful and helpful. They certainly have serious I.O., CPU, and RAM consequences. They're, gonna, they're still rewriting the table in the background. Um, the other challenge is the new column. You don't get it until the end of the operation, where with, with TokenDB, it's, it's available immediately. I think you know this last point is important. I think many uh, developers and database folks are considering some of these NoSQL solutions uh, just because they don't want these limitations. And for example, in MongoDB, when you want a new attribute on a collection, you just do it. And when you store the document, you put the new attribute in there, it's there. All existing documents don't need to be rewritten because they don't actually contain that attribute. So I think a lot of people are, are, are taking a look at these other texts um, just to see what can be done there. So if we look at one of these operations, we want to add a column uh, to T1, we want to add column C4, 
kind of the example we showed prior. NODB is going to lock the table, the entire operation. Um, goes read only, so at least you can you can read the table if you needed to. Um, it's going to physically rebuild the indexes, even though they, they really weren't involved in the in the process. There, there would seem to be no way to do that. Um, table goes read only. That's that document's a little off. There is access allowed. It just reads. In TokenDB, we're going to drop a message in the uh, in the root node, and and we're done. You immediately have that new column update your application, get back to work. As that last bullet says, over time, that message is slowly going to work its way down the fractal tree. And when it eventually hits the, read, the lead node, it's going to rewrite lead nodes one at a time instead of as a, as a bulk operation to, uh, to what NODB did. And in, the, and in the meantime, like a row coming up through, it's being processed by that message buffer mm -hmm. to modify the data would be it's like an alter or a yep. column. Or yeah, so, so anytime, it's a good point. When you, when you go to do a query, the query is going to go down the lead node to get the, the base node itself, but the insert might still be a message and have, not have made it down. Right. So that's somewhere in the tree. And above that might be an add column, and above that might be a delete message. So it's going to materialize a stack of, of message applications, at the very top of which might be that delete, at which point the user gets Zero rows. You know, it's, it's uh, that all has to be done. Uh, and the act of doing time. that doesn't force the I/O. It's just once the buffer fills and pushes down that the I/O gets access and pushes the disk. Yep. So, so what if there's a problem where you have something like you've done an alter table to add a column, but then you insert something and you don't name the column or something? I mean, how long do you have to wait to get an error back for something like that? Because if it just goes in the message queue, like the insert just goes in the message queue, does it check the stack for the schema and what it should be? The, the insert goes in the message queue, but, but we're still, uh, MySQL is still above us. So when you do an add column message, for example, an add column operation, the message lands in the root node of the tree, but we still have, from a MySQL perspective, have to modify the table metadata. So MySQL is still the, the source of truth in terms of what the schema looks like for the table. So does that happen right away so that Absolutely. new? Yeah. I mean, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a blocking operation for a moment because we have to take a metadata lock with MySQL. We have to update the, the schema for that table and then give give the table back to MySQL to uh, to get back to the work. But to your point, you know, we're, when you do that query, <coughs> what we the, the benefit we've just done to ourselves is that leaf node is now in memory. So should it be time? Should these messages have pushed all the way to the bottom? Then we will apply all the messages to that leaf node. It gets dirty. And then on the next checkpoint, it gets written out to disk. It has a nice, new, clean uh, format. But we don't really, uh, there's, a, there's another operation that's going on in the background. We call it a cleaner thread. And the cleaner thread's job is to just keep an eye on these trees and, and to just always wait for things to push. You know, you might be uh, creating a problem because if your system's idle for a period of time, it would make sense. Why not start pushing some of these messages down and getting the work done in advance? So, so there are um, activities going on in the background try to scrub these trees and keep them clean. With during a shutdown or something like that, if, these, if those buffers are too large, that can increase your shutdown time as well. Yeah, and we, we another difference between us and NODB, we checkpoint frequently. So our checkpoint operation by default is every 60 seconds, we're going to write anything, any dirtiness in your tree, it's going to get rid of the disk, where NODB, I think, is more, uh, it tends to delay that, that operation, it does what's called a fuzzy checkpoint. So it, um, there's certain operations that, and you know, you could, in theory, in an hour, if you run the right benchmark, you could dirty a 48 gig cache. And when you go to shut down, you're going to be sitting there for a very long time. Where uh, with us, um, it's only going to let you get about 60 seconds away from where it was at the last checkpoint, and then get working in the background on the next checkpoint. But what if you have you know, two gigabytes, five gigabytes of data at, in one table, run an ad column, shut down the server? That ad column is, is Probably not much more than the bytes add column per end. Okay, the, so that sits. So that buffer that sits in the buffer still. That, that, the buffer is written in disk. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we checkpoint the whole tree. So if, if, if all you've done is injected a single message into the header, then that that's going to land in the next checkpoint. The other thing to keep in mind here is there's no there's no getting around the uh, the the edge case for that that type of, of uh, operation. So if I did if I added that column and on a two billion row table. I can give it back like that, and you say select star from table where pk equals 5, I'll give you back that, the default value for that column. If your very next statement was update table name set that new column equal 5, 
semicolon and you want to hit the whole table, there, there's, there's no way around the, the expense of that operation. So a fractal tree doesn't save you from the fact that if you're mutating two billion rows, those two billion mutations have to actually happen. Like we just find you know, the, the pattern is not normally that. Normally you would give it a default of what that next statement was going to set it to. But if you want to update two billion rows like one at a time, that's still an expensive operation. We have something we call hot indexing. And, and what a hot index is, is in the background, it's going to build an index. So the traditional MySQL, when you want to add an index to, uh, to NODB, it's going to lock the table. It's going to go read only for the uh, duration of that operation. And depending on how big your table is, that could take hours. It could take days. Uh, it's really just as fast as your hardware supports. Um, with us, with our messaging architecture, we're able to, to create this in the background. So a create index operation, it starts creating the index in the background. Um, the index is going to be available when it's when the indexing operation is done, but the table is fully available during the operation. And then we do a nice job uh, on show process list with MySQL admins in, in, the, uh, in attendance. If you do a show process list, it's going to give you a very good feel for how long it's going to be before that index is actually online and usable. Um, I didn't want to show any more uh, TopoDB benchmarks, but I did want to show a couple uh, on the Mongo front because I think these are an interesting comparison between uh, vanilla Mongo technology and what we see off to the right here we call it MongoDB plus fractal tree indexes. So these, these particular benchmarks were run off of a, uh, kind of the, the prototype implementation we did late last year. But they show a very similar characteristic to what we saw with the, the comparison with NODB. So same thing here. If I just do a raw index insertion, I'm going to put documents in a collection, I'm going to index multiple fields in multiple indexes. Uh, Mongo quickly drops to, uh, to very uh, significantly lower levels of performance on, on this particular server once the database uh, gets bigger than RAM. And I think one of the Mongo, uh, what they will tell you is size your Mongo server appropriately. You want to have a server that's got the amount of physical RAM that's equivalent to the working data set. And working data set's important here. It doesn't mean if you've got a, a two a two gigabyte or two terabyte Mongo database that you need two terabytes of RAM, but the amount of data you're churning needs to fit in main memory. Um, so you, you can see from this benchmark, it looks very similar. Uh, the Toku version was slightly faster when it was completely in memory, but it pretty much leveled off in the 7,000 uh, document inserts per second. And the Mongo uh, quickly came down. The reason the Mongo version doesn't run all the way to the right is I didn't have a leak uh, because it was, it was starting to get down to the performance levels where it would have taken a very long time to get out to the 200 million inserts that I did with, uh, with our implementation. Um, there is a flip side to this insertion performance. So I did, a, uh, I did a second benchmark where I was inserting data, and once per minute I would have a second thread wake up and do a, uh, a scan of a thousand documents that were an index scan of a thousand documents. So this first example is, hey, if I, if I use a um, a non-covering index, let's compare. Uh, this is the query latency of that, that thread that once per minute wakes up and goes out and gets 1,000. And as you can see here, uh, when there weren't that many documents, it was mostly uh, in memory. Performance was neck and neck between the two technologies. Uh, once the data was larger than RAM and Mongo had, was actually doing I.O. for the inserts, plus having to do I.O. for the queries, uh, it got much worse. And, and the scale on this is, uh, is logarithmic, so when I had the scale of this uh, as linear, uh, the graphs were really hard to read. So uh, in the example here, it's 100 milliseconds latency for, for us and 10,000 milliseconds uh, up in the, uh, the Mongo side there. When I changed it to be covering, I went into Mongo and I added uh, additional attributes to my index so that the queries could be covered. A covering index is an index where the, the query can be satisfied by the index itself. It doesn't have to actually go back to anything else to get data. Um, Mongo looked a lot better. Um, what was interesting to me was the, the kind of mountain that was created in the middle. It seemed to be leveling off to something a little more friendly. Um, at some point, I want to run this one out to see where that line goes. Maybe it goes up again. But, but certainly, it's still, uh, at least the scale on this one is a positive thing. Much more usable. But you know, your query latency was. 500 milliseconds, so half a second uh, per query on some of these. Uh, benchmark 3 is something that, that Mongo has uh, 
the ability, uh, in Mongo, you can have a field as an array. And the array, if you index that field, it, it creates what's called a multi-key insert. What I wanted to see was, if, if try to, to try to be a little more fair and really test the indexing performance, let's, let's create a document that has a, a, an array of 100 elements. And I think Mongo would probably not recommend you do this unless you had a really large server RAM-wise, and I think the graph really bears that out. But. So I do that same index insertion benchmark from the first example, but instead of, um, instead of a field that only has one value, it has 100 values. As you can see here, again, the, the trend with Tofu is to, to maintain a level of performance and keep that. Um, the Mongo line here went down to about one and a half inserts per second. Um, that was at 35 million uh, document insertions. So what it really shows is the, the strength of indexing of, of fractal trees when you're doing 100x the amount of indexing, can really affect your insertion workload with other technologies. Uh, that is it for my slides. I'm certainly happy to take questions. In your showing the difference between binary tree and the fractal, fra fractal tree, fractal index tree. Feature, tree, not binary. Oh, the feature. Is fractal index, is that still some uh, layer above the B tree? Is that the same? Using the same underlying B tree structure? I'll let you. can give you a little deeper. So it's, it's a little co confusing because all the examples of the B tree that Tim had all had new breed two. Right. Children two. So B tree, you can have lots of children. Yeah, and um, so the fractal trees look like B trees, but they also have these message buffers adjoined onto each node. I see. So, so the only difference, uh, major difference, uh, the major difference is that the uh, flat tree has message buffer, but B tree doesn't have the message buffer. And, and then if you oh. then if you size those buffers in a certain way, use a certain algorithm for pushing messages down, you can get theoretically provably good behavior oh, okay. under the worst case insertion also, workloads. Okay, so, so the fractal part of nature of that is basically the cascading of the message is down. Well, well, where's the fractal? So, in some sense, if you were to look inside one of those buffers, there's a tree in there as well. Okay. And it turns out that tree, in theory, you can play the same game on. You don't. You only go up to two levels. Uh -huh. But if you, if you go to the theoretical literature, oh, you, know, okay, you okay, have okay. a tree and you have a tree, tree inside, inside the tree. Okay, okay. It's trees all okay, the way down. Okay. Okay. But you only go down two, two layers. Two, 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 two layers. Okay. 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 Um, is either the MySQL fractal tree stuff or the MongoDB fractal tree stuff, tree stuff open source? Are they both closed source? or? They are both closed source. We have um, the Mongo is still experimental. Okay. Mongo's not source, no source, no, no binary. No. <laughs> okay. So, so on the Mongo front, it's experimental. The I thought you, I thought you had posted something where you committed something to Mongo source, and I wasn't sure if this was it. No, I committed. I, I created a sysbench benchmark for MongoDB, oh, so I could okay. compare Mongo uh, running sysbench against Mongo versus running sysbench against Mongo plus fractal tree indexes. Uh, so from a MySQL perspective, we are. Uh, the Fractal Tree engine is a shared library. And uh, we had to patch MySQL to get uh, certain aspects of functionality. So all our MySQL patches are available to source on our website. Uh, to create a storage engine, you have to write a Handlerton. And our Handlerton is fully, uh, the source is fully available on our website as well. So certainly if someone were, were interested in writing, a, uh, writing their own storage engine, it might be interesting to look at our implementation of the Handlerton and, and see very contrasted to how I know did it or my ISAM or somebody else. Um, but the fractal tree its, uh, engine itself is close to it. And we do have you know, a couple of our users prefer to take our take the source and take the uh, shared library and compile uh, and link themselves. Uh, a couple. Not many, but the ones that do uh, report success in doing that on multiple platforms. Uh, we put out a single tarball that we compile on CentOS 5 and tends to run every Any other questions? It's in brainstorming. What should what should we call it instead of instead of MongoDB plus fractal tree indexes? <laughs> Is there a attention person here? 
I think someone from TenGen is going to speak at some point. No, we have a Mongo session, but I don't think that's from someone at TenGen. Yeah, we are thinking about a, a name because, as you can see, when I blog about it, it's, it's a lot of words to say. MongoDB plus fractal tree indexes takes up a lot of space in a blog and a title. Just, just call it WebScale. In a tweet. <laughs> Mongo fract. <laughs> Fracking Mongo. Fracking. All right. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks.